one more song, and I'm going to need some help with this. Uh, I need some animals. I need some animals that were on the park. What do you think? A tiger. A wolf? Oh! Okay. A monkey? Take me out of the dark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let there be light. I know, don't know if y'all noticed that uh, you can tell that Thad and Nick are still young men. There was no groaning or moaning as they got up from kneeling. There's no <laughs> but that, was a, that will come with age. Welcome, everyone. It's time to begin our worship service this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces and that you're here today. Let's worship the Lord our God and. Today I've chosen Psalm 100 to read before us beginning this morning. If it's convenient, would you please stand? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, and he, it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's worship. <laughs>
if you all have not picked up a communion pack, uh, there'll be some young men walking down the aisles. If you need one, please raise your hand. Uh, to help us focus our minds on uh, why we come together uh, for communion, I'll be reading from Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 2, verses uh, 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and was broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that we might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached to us, or preached peace to us, who were afar and to those who were near for through him we both have access by one spirit to the father would you please pray with me our God and father we come before you uh, thanking you for your son and his sacrifice and what he has done for us we pray uh, that as we come together, that we focus our minds on the true sacrifice that was given for us, for our sins, uh, something that we could not reconcile without Christ. We pray that we're always mindful of that, not just on the first day of the week as we come together, but every day, that we have to be thankful for the love that he showed, the life that he led, uh, and the examples that he left for us. We pray that we always keep that in mind and that when he went through this torture, he was a man. A man knowing what he had to go through for us and he was willing to do that for us. We pray that we're always mindful of that and that when we take this bread that is a representation of his body, that we're remembering the body that was given for us. Uh, we pray that you bless this bread and that all that we do and the way that we take it always glorifies you, and it is through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please pray with me. Our God and Father, we come before you again. Uh, thank you once again for your son. Uh, we thank you for his willingness to go to that cross, uh, to have his blood shed for the remission of our sins. We pray that uh, we're always mindful of that blood that was shed for us uh, so that we could be with you in eternity. We pray that uh, we take this cup in a manner that's pleasing to you. We pray that you bless it for us, and it is through Christ we pray. Amen. At this time, uh, we're also commanded to store. Uh, so if you would please 
uh, join us in this prayer for the offering. Uh, there are several ways you can uh, leave an offering. There are boxes in the back of the auditorium. Uh, you can do it online, or you can mail your offering to the church office. Uh, would you please pray for me? Our God and Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for uh, loving us. We thank you for the abilities you give us. Uh, we pray that the money that uh, we give uh, is used to further your kingdom. We pray that we're always good stewards of those things. We also pray that uh, the giver is giving with a joyful heart. We thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we uh, ask for this in the name of your son, Christ. Amen. church I have unfortunately it seems like developed a little bit of a sinus problem and so uh, uh, bear with me as I sniffle my way through the message this morning I want to take a little departure from the lessons that we've been looking at for the past several weeks I do plan definitely to go back to those but given the uh, time of you the, the time of, of uh, the year that we are in, it is, I think, an appropriate thought for us to focus on what this time of year means, to think about what it means as God's children to be people who are willing to give thanks to God. <sighs> so you be thankful. And that's pretty much my sermon this morning. (laughs) 
I think I'll just take some things out of order, and uh, we'll come back to some of it. I, I don't know where it's going to show up, so let me just take some things out of order. Did you know, there we go, did you know that our oldest U.S. holiday is Thanksgiving? Now, it's not the oldest holiday. I, people have been celebrating Christmas, been celebrating Easter, certainly a lot longer than that. But this is the oldest U.S. holiday, a holiday that originated with this country. In fact, even before we gained our independence from England, this will be our 410th year to observe Thanksgiving. And I say that because I realize, and I'm sure that you're thinking along with me, that a lot has happened and that our, our culture today is taking us, I think, further and further away from what was intended originally with what we think of as Thanksgiving. It's older than a lot of things that we today associate with Thanksgiving. Like, for instance, and boy, I'm about to step on toes now, including mine. <clears throat> we may think of it as, well, <laughs> that's football. It's older than that first college football game between Yale and Princeton in 1876. And it's certainly older than the four-day, 24-hour football marathon that is modern-day Thanksgiving. NCAA, NFL, high school, whatever you want to watch, whatever time of day or night that you want to watch it. And it's older than the entrenchments of our capitalist society. I started getting my sales emails about a month ago. Today, most people think of Thursday, the fourth Thursday of November, as the day before Black Friday. It's older than some of the things that we think of today when we think about this holiday. Originally, it was simply a day to give thanks. And I think it's something that we as a nation have lost sight of. Did you know that even though it is our oldest holiday, it, it wasn't always what we know of today as a, a federal holiday. The First Continental Congress convened in 1774 and, and dismissed itself later that year. The Second Continental Congress began in 1775 and disbanded in 1781. And it took up the subject of whether or not Thanksgiving should be a national holiday, and it determined that it would be. But when the Second Continental Congress disbanded in 1781, its authority also went with it. And it's no longer, at that point, a federal holiday. The first U.S. Congress took up the discussion in 1798, and they decided that Thanksgiving would not be a federal holiday. Now, it's not because they were the original Grinch with a heart three sizes too small. It's simply because they wanted to give deference to states' rights, and when it came to the subject of Thanksgiving, they determined that it should be up to each individual state as to when and how a Thanksgiving observance would take place. They were all for it. They just said it didn't need to be a federally mandated holiday. And that's the way it remained, each state choosing for itself the when and how until October the 3rd, 1863, when our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, determined that the fourth Thursday of November, and that year it happened to be November the 26th, will be a national Thanksgiving holiday. And every president from Lincoln down to Franklin D. Roosevelt followed that example, each one making a presidential determination 
that there would be a Thanksgiving celebration every year of their administration in the fourth Thursday of November each year. Roosevelt wasn't always the popular president that the history books would like us to think that he was. People didn't always agree with the ideas that he came up with, and he came up with an idea regarding Thanksgiving that no one liked. He decided that Thanksgiving would be moved to the third Thursday in November because he wanted to give one extra week of Christmas shopping to the Americans in order to boost the economy. And in those days, they thought that was inappropriate. They thought that was a departure from what Thanksgiving was all about. And so in 1941, the Congress began to discuss that, and they came up in 1942 with a joint resolution determining that from that day forward, it would be a federal holiday to be observed on the fourth Thursday in November, and that's how it got to be what we know it to be today. But what we think of today, I think, sometimes has taken us far afield from what it was intended to be when that first Thanksgiving feast was observed. Four days from now, family and friends are going to come together for our 410th Thanksgiving anniversary celebration. I, I think God has been good to this nation. I wonder what's in our future. Historically, the idea was always about giving thanks. It wasn't about sports. It wasn't about a, a day off from work. It wasn't even about turkey and pumpkin pie, and I certainly have no objection to any of that. But it was first and foremost a necessity in the minds of people of faith that God should be and that God would be thanked for all of his divine blessings that he's given. That's how it got started. That's what it was intended to be. And that seems to be the thing that is lost in our culture and our society today. I want to take off from that, and I want to talk about being thankful people, not with respect to a holiday, but with respect to a, a way of living, a mindset. And there are three things I want to say about it. Number one, giving thanks to God is a necessity in the minds of people of faith. I want you to think about what I'm saying there. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a recommended thing. I'm saying that when you actually live by faith, when you understand that you, as Paul said to the Athenians, exist, you move, you breathe, you breathe, you have your very being because God created you, it is to your way of thinking an absolute necessity that you say thank you. We go to a restaurant and some young person that I don't know, maybe it's an older person who's had a lot of problems in life, comes to my table repeatedly and fills my coffee cup, comes to my table repeatedly and, 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 and fills up my, my tea glass without being asked, they do not leave my table without me saying thank you. I, I, can't, I can't imagine not wanting to thank them, and they're just taking care of my tea. God gave me life. I got to wake up again today. So did you. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. I certainly hope I'm preaching to the choir here. That, that you're all in agreement with me that we're all on the same page. That we understand that we owe everything to God. And for us, it is not just a good thing to do. It's a necessity of people of faith that we give thanks to God. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything... Give thanks, for that is God's will for you in Christ. At the time of his writing this letter, the church at Thessalonica was new. They were all babes in Christ. It, the, from, the, from the time that Paul established that congregation 
to the time they write this letter was just really in the space of a few years. They're all new converts. And Paul says, this is the new you. You rejoice always. You never stop praying. In everything in life, you give thanks. You need to know that is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It is a learned attribute, but you cannot be a man of faith or a woman of faith unless you do learn things. Thanksgiving of heart, being grateful is one of those things. Sort of an interesting word that I've highlighted for you there, everything. I know it's not a deep word. I know nobody's scratching their head saying, I wonder what that word means. You know what it means. But it comes from a sort of an interesting Greek word, a little bitty word, easy to say. But it's a word that is associated with what is called count nouns. I know that doesn't sound right. You know what a noun is? A person, a place, or a thing. When you want to talk about how many persons or places or things, we give a numeric value to it. I'm going to go hang out with three of my friends tomorrow. If we want to express the totality, we have a word. In this case, it's everything. Whatever your circumstances are in life, whatever. Have you ever heard a song? We don't sing it much anymore, but have you ever heard the song, Count Your Many Blessings? Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and it will what? Surprise you what the Lord has done. Well, that's really what this word in the, in the original language was, was all about. Stop and think about all that there is to be thankful for. In everything, give thanks. That, that requires observation on our part. Men and women of faith recognize what God is, has done and is doing. And when you have a grateful heart, your relationship with God strong. It's unavoidably strong. Ephesians 5 verse 20, Paul said the church at Ephesus is always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. It says basically the same thing. So here are two letters to do two different churches, both of them fairly young. He says to one in everything give thanks. He says to the other always giving thanks for all things. Now, I want you to, to look at that, and then I want you to think about the setting. I want you to think about the times in which these people lived, and I want you to think about how much different it is to be a man or woman of faith versus to be just a citizen of the town of Thessalonica or a citizen of the town of Ephesus in the first century. And let me suggest that what Paul is saying here is radically different from society. Having a heart of thanksgiving is radical thinking. It is not the mindset of the culture that we're a part of. So which way are we going to go? Are we going to be a part of our culture and necessarily be ungrateful? Or are we going to be men and women of faith and necessarily choose to be thankful? It's radical thinking. Peter and John, we're told in Acts chapter 3, are approaching the temple at the hour of prayer. They are confronted by a man who has been lame from birth every day. Friends will take him and set him at, at, a, at a gateway, one of the entrances into the temple, where the traffic will flow by to give him an opportunity to beg for alms every day for subsistence living. Peter and John happen to be going that way. He begs for alms. Peter doesn't give him alms. He said, what I have for you is the authority of Jesus. Stand up and walk. And this man instantly is healed of his lameness. He's now leaping about. He's now praising God. He's now clinging to Peter and John because these men have changed his life. I think that you could assume he had a grateful heart and an attitude of thanksgiving. And the fact that he's doing that begins to draw attention to these men. And a crowd begins to assemble around them. Peter takes the opportunity to preach another sermon. It becomes a, 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 
a magnet for people coming in and the temple guard assume that something is wrong and so Peter and John and the man who is now healed are thrown in jail imagine the first day that you get to walk you get to spend the night in jail because you're grateful <laughs> for being able to walk and this is in a religious society they're bound over for trial and the next day they are found guilty of preaching in the name of Jesus and they are ordered not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus and rather than say look at the thanks that we get Lord for preaching your name you told us to do this and you let this bad thing happen to us that's that's not the attitude of these men of necessity they give thanks to God they go back and report to the other apostles what had happened and then the whole group prays to God and asks that God would continue to grant them opportunities to speak the gospel see there are other people who need to have the same joy that this lame man had not because they've been healed of some physical malady but because they've been blood bought they've been redeemed they've been forgiven they've been given an eternal home and that evokes from you a spirit of gratefulness well a short time later this prayer having been answered they're continuing to proclaim the gospel and now all 12 of them are arrested and after an examination they are publicly flogged and then told to speak no longer in the name of Jesus so they went out on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name let me suggest that, that puts a whole new twist on what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in everything give thanks what they did was give thanks that's radical thinking point number two living but not giving thanks to God is outrageous it's not negligence it's outrageous why would you do it would you thinkingly do it would you knowingly do it in James chapter 1 James says in verse 16 do not be deceived my beloved brethren every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow do not be deceived my beloved what what's he getting at there when you and I are going along in life and good things happen to us and somebody attributes that to well you you got a good education you're going along in life and, and, and you get a promotion and they attribute it to the fact well you were at the right place at the right time you're going through life and things are going your way and people attribute it to the fact that you know you're just one of those people you just always get lucky and you and I start listening to that and buying into that you know what we have become starts with a D it's in the first verse of the line if you need any help we have become deceived we've lost sight of the fact that every good thing that happens comes from God you wouldn't do this be an ungrateful unthankful person because you know that God cares for you you don't see yourself as being lucky I, I I'm sure that I slip up and, and don't catch it but I have consciously since my early 20s I've consciously made an effort to never call myself lucky and, and I, I know it's the way of, of, of our speech and it's a, it's a figure of speech and everybody uses it and I'm not going to throw rocks at you if, you if you do it, but I hope that you'll consciously realize we're not really lucky. We're blessed. The things that God does for us, he does for us because he loves us, because he wants to prosper us. Uh, what did Paul say to the Ephesians? Now to him who's able to give us exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. He didn't say in Ephesians 3 verse 20, now to him who lets us be lucky because it's not about luck it's not some cosmic wheel out there that call a wheel of fortune that spins and whenever it comes to stop and whatever number the air falls on you look down and you've got that slip and you say oh it's my lucky day it's not what it's about we understand that but do we give thanks for God 
to, to for what God's done for us? To live because God lets us, but not give thanks to God. It's outrageous. James says, you need to know every good and perfect gift in your life has come from God. And that evokes from us a, a, an attitude of gratefulness to be thankful. And if, if we're not, that's not negligence. That's not an oversight. That is an attitude of ungratefulness that is an affront and an offense to our God. Paul, in a couple of passages in the New Testament, talks about a coming apostasy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. Apostasy. Oh, that's another one of those churchy words again. One of those words that you may very well know what it means, but you'll not use it in any other context except for when Christians get together and we're talking about Bible concepts because apostasy is just not going to come up when you go to work tomorrow. It is a word that, that means to fall away. But it's even a little bit more involved than just falling away. Sometimes you, 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 you fall away through being inattentive. It's not that you mean to. It's just that you, you, you stop focusing on something, and the next thing you know, as the Hebrew writer says, you begin to drift. But apostasy is, is more than that. Apostasy actually involves a, a, an act of will or determination. It's a transliterated Greek word. Uh, we have a number of words in our English language that are actually Greek words. We just gave them an English sound. Everybody understands that Christianity involves being baptized. Whatever you think baptism means and whatever you think defines the word, everybody understands that Christians are baptized. Baptized is a Greek word that we just gave an English word, a sound to it. Baptizo becomes baptized. And apostasia becomes apostasy. It's a Greek word. We just gave it an English letters and an English way of pronouncing it. It's an act of refusing to accept or acknowledge something. There comes a point in time where you say, I know that's what it says, but this is the way that we're going to do it. You've gone into apostasy. You have willfully chosen to go down that pathway. It's not accidental. It's not just through neglect. And so in these two passages, Paul talks about a coming apostasy. Now, hopefully by now you're thinking, I, I, what would be some examples of it? What, what would it look like if people go into apostasy? Well, he gives us some examples of that. One, they pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that this morning we will stand here and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, and tonight when nobody's looking, at the stroke of midnight, we're going to put on long capes and robes and go out into the forest and hold candles and chant as we go counterclockwise and sprinkle the blood of chickens on our heads. There's no demonic, satanic thing necessarily involved in this. All you have to do to pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons is let yourself be deceived by that which God didn't say and believe it to be true. That's what apostasy begins with, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. God didn't teach that. Man did. God didn't say by doing that you please God. Man did. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Devising rules, for instance, Paul said, that some Christians can't be married because. Now, we're not talking about whether they've been married before or not. We're not talking about whether they have the scriptural reason to remarry. We're simply saying that, that some religious groups will say, hey, if you want to serve the Lord in this group and, and serve in this way, you can't have a wife. You can think of some religious groups that practice that today. That was predicted a long ago as a part of the apostate movement, that people would say, this is how you be ple you're pleasing to God. If you buy into that, you've been deceived. 
requiring Christians to abstain from foods that God has created for you to eat gratefully or by giving thanks. And there are people who have been taught that religiously you, you can't eat meat on Fridays, for instance. Or we're in the Lenten season and for the next 40 days we can't eat this or that or the other. That didn't come from the Bible. That's not the conduct of Christianity. If you're willing to eat what God has given you and you're willing to be thankful for it, God is pleased to give it to you. But see, it's an attitude of thanksgiving. To reject what God has given to you for your benefit is to be ungrateful, to be outrageous. We, we might suppose that Whatever Paul's talking about when he's talking about apostles, we might suppose, boy, these, if sins had categories, these would be the worst kinds of sins, egregious acts that a person can commit. Well, here's a list for you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, realize this, that in the last days, and we're in them, in the last days difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Boy, I, I would say there are some pretty egregious sins and sinful acts in that list and Paul says that you and I need to avoid these kinds of people but did you notice that he also says about these people verse 5 they're the ones who are holding to a form of godliness although they had denied its power see my first thought as I read this is to say not only who are these people but where do they live Paul, can you give us a map and draw a circle around their neighborhood so that I don't even have to drive through there? Do you have a mental picture of where these people live on the other side of the tracks? In your picture, is it that they live in the inner city and in those government projects and they're, they're tearing them up and they're always rioting and, 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 and marking on things? Are, are those the people that he's talking about? No, not according to verse 5. These are people who are holding to a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. I've got the name Christian, and I enjoy all the, the, the benefits that my society affords to me because they respect Christianity, but I'm not going to let the Bible change who I am, okay? I'll be here on Sunday, but I'm still going to keep thinking the way I've always thought. I'm still going to keep doing the things I've always done. Uh, it's not going to change me. Paul says you've gone off into apostasy. You've become these people. And some pretty bad things were in that list. Did you see the one that was a surprise to you in the list? God says when you're ungrateful, you're one of these people. Part of the apostasy is losing the desire to be thankful to God. Point number three in the lesson will be yours. Giving thanks to God lifts us up above and beyond whatever our present circumstances are. Being thankful to God changes who you are from the inside out. Second Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 16. Therefore, Paul says, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary Light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but things which are not seen are eternal. If I could give you a homework assignment and you would seriously take it, here's what it would be. Jot this reference down. Spend the week meditating on these three verses Commit them to memory. Underline them in your Bible. Mull over what he means in verse 17. This is a guy who has been stoned. He's been left for dead. 
He's been shipwrecked. He's received stripes by the Jews, blows uh, by the rods, the Romans. He's been hounded. He's been uh, assaulted. He's been falsely accused. He's been wrongfully imprisoned time after time after time after time. If you're keeping score of all the bad things that have happened to you just because you are an ambassador of Christ, let me tell you something, your list pales in comparison to the list that Paul gives. And Paul says, here's how I look at that. Momentary light affliction is producing an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. When Paul looked past the bad things that the world threw his way and recognized that he is a sinner, chief among sinners, forgiven by the grace of God, it changed who he was. It changed his attitude. It lifted him beyond his circumstances. When you and I have an attitude of thanksgiving to God, an attitude of gratitude, it changes who we are. Let me give you an illustration from the Old Testament. Two prominent men in the Old Testament, you know both of them, both of them believers in God. Both of them were exalted by God. They were raised above their station. If you'd have seen them as a young person and then see them after God had exalted them, you would never have thought that that guy would have come from where he was to where he is now. God has exalted both of these men and greatly blessed both of them. They were contemporaries, and more than that, they knew each other, and they knew each other very well, and each knew that God had given kindness and blessings to the other one. You got these two guys in mind yet? You got names for them? In life, these two men, having this in common, go in two different directions. The direction of one led to a long, healthy life and a very fulfilling life. And the direction of the other led to acts of uncontrollable rage, to severe bouts of depression and paranoia. And his life ended prematurely and ingloriously, despicably, violently. You got them figured out yet? One was King David, and the other was King Saul. One never failed to give thanks to God in the midst of hardships and misery. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. That's David. Always thankful to God. One stopped giving thanks and grew angry with God and with man, and it ruined his life, and it ruined his relationships, and it ruined his career, and it cost him his life. You take the things that happened to these two men and put them side by side. By anybody's measure of keeping score, David had more bad things in life happen to him than what happened to Saul. But David saw past all of that and always gave thanks to God when he's in the cave, when he's hiding. What's he doing? He's writing a psalm of thanks to God. He's putting his trust in God. And God exalted him and lifted him up. It changed who he was. When you and I get past the things that we think are terrible and unfair in our life and realize that we've been blessed by God and that God loves us, it gives us a whole new outlook on our life. David said, I will extol you, O Lord, for you've lifted me up. And not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you've brought me up, brought up my soul from Sheol. You kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Giving thanks to God, let David soar. Change who he was. But his circumstances weren't different 
from those of Saul. In fact, I think I've made the argument, we might say that he had a lot more bad things happen to him in his life than Saul ever had happen to him. But here's what happened to Saul. By not giving thanks, he doesn't soar above his circumstances. He's angry and bitter all the time. He doesn't give thanks that God has given him a warrior that has helped him to defeat the, the enemy of his nation. He gets angry that the people are singing a song. Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. Ungrateful means unhappy and bitter. He doesn't soar. He drowns. We're not immune to difficult times because we're Christians. But with gratitude, they don't define who we are. We don't need to be deceived when the world tells us things that are not true. When the colonists left England and made it through that, that first year and then got their bounty going into the next year, they stopped for a, a day of Thanksgiving, 1621. I, I have an idea that they, they had no idea what they had set in motion. It was the New England colonies, later the New England states, that kept that tradition alive year by year until one day it does become a federally mandated holiday that we give thanks to God on the fourth Thursday of every year. My question is, I know we've got 409 in our rearview mirror, and we're four days away from our 410th. How many more do we as a nation have in our future? I would guess not many if we continue to be an ungrateful and unthankful society. Our culture has taken us a long way from the attitude of gratitude that they had and recognize that God had seen them through some pretty rough times. Let's, let's be people who are thankful to God, not because... It's an American tradition, not because it's our heritage, but because for us it is a necessity of faith. Because we understand that it would be outrageous to be called a child of God but be ungrateful because giving thanks to God lifts our spirits, lifts our souls, reminds us that God is with us. What did John say? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I won't see you next Sunday. Debbie and I are going to leave just a few minutes from now and go home and finish packing up. And We're going to go about six and a half hours further north from here. I guess it's not cold enough for us. But we're going to spend some time with her family and enjoy a family reunion. We want you to know you're our family. We look forward to seeing you when we come back. We always want to extend an invitation. Maybe some things have been said this morning have touched your heart. Maybe this morning you want to renew an attitude of gratitude. We'll have an elder at the front. We'll have elders at the back. It may be this morning that you have prayer concerns or something that you, you need help and understanding on. Maybe you want to know what it means to become a child of God as is taught in the Bible. Maybe as a Christian you recognize that you want to be a part of the work that these elders are leading us in in this congregation. Seek one of those elders out while we're singing this song of encouragement. Let's stand. <coughs>
Again, it is good to see everyone here this morning. If you're a visitor, then please stay for a little while so we can say howdy to you and thank you for coming today. And it is our prayer that you have been uplifted and blessed by the worship service this morning. Uh, a few announcements to bring. Uh, Frances Pale has COVID. Please remember her in your prayers. Um, Alan is going to have surgery on November the 28th on his right knee. And um, we pray that all goes well for you. Uh, Becky Yellett's uh, grandnephew, Rainier Kerr, the cancer has returned to him and it has uh, appeared in his lung. They will do uh, surgery is scheduled for in December and then they will, do uh, they will also do chemotherapy to try and get the cancer under control. Also, Vivian Allen's nephew, Jerry Austin, has uh, bladder cancer and she has asked prayers for him and to remember uh, him in your prayers. On Wednesday, November the 23rd, there will not be an assembly at the building here. Uh, December the 3rd, uh, next, uh, George and Vanessa Bakken are moving and Richard has, if you're wish, willing to help them move, then please see Richard Dean. He's not here this morning, but reach out to him so the, to get George and Vanessa on the way. Also this evening, we will have a meeting here at the building. If your small group is not uh, meeting this evening, then please come at the building and worship God here. Again, thank you, DC, for the lesson this morning. And uh, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful to to be called your sons and daughters. We are thankful, dear Lord, for all that you do for us. We would. Uh, we couldn't begin to number the many things that you have done for us and for what you do each day. Uh, dear Father, we are a grateful and trusting people in your wisdom and your word and what you do for us. Dear Father, we also ask uh, a special blessing upon those that were mentioned for the, the have for Alan as he is, has upcoming surgery and be with our uh, sister Frances that uh, to help her get over COVID, dear father, and be with Rainier and Jerry as they battle cancers that give wisdom to the doctors. And we know that you are the great physician and are able to heal uh, all things. Dear father, we're also mindful of those who are young mothers, be with them as they carry the child that Uh, all will be well for for them and the child. Dear Father, help us as parents to be good parents, to bring up the child and uh, to be a Christian and, and work in service in your church here on, dear Father. Be with us as elders as we make decisions to be done so wisely and that uh, we may lead the congregation uh, onward to uh, to grow and strengthen in numbers and in spiritual growth, dear Father. Be with uh, each of us as we travel upon the road these days for as we travel to see friends and family that give us a safe trip uh, there and back. And uh, we're thankful for the good times that we look forward to having with our the friends and family, dear Father. In all things, we give thanks through your Son, Jesus the Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Sing one final song, and then Brother Mike. Yeah. 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 Someday.
Before I read the closing scripture, I'd just like to second Lee's comments and thank D.C. for reminding us just how truly blessed we are in our need always to give thanks for um, all that the Lord has done for us in all things. For our closing scripture, I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21 from the New King James Bible. If you would please stand for the reading of the Lord's word. For this reason I have bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the, by, in the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. And the church says, Amen. Amen.